touch the leper's skin. I feel your touch right now. You are the same God. 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 You never fail. You never fail. I will need you. I will need you, God. Yeah, yeah. We need you, Lord. We need you, Lord. I'm calling on the Holy Spirit. A mighty river, come and fill me. Fill me again. Come and feel me again. It's a heart cry, Jesus. It's a heart cry, Lord. Come and feel us up, overflowing the cup. We long for your presence.
want to welcome our online audience, all those watching from wherever you're at today. Thank you for taking time to join us for this online service. And we want to invite you, if you're ever in our area, please stop in, be our guest. We would love to meet you in person. It's one thing to watch online, but it's on a whole nother level to be here in person. Stop in, be our guest. Today, we're going to get you ready to conclude a series that we've been doing called Views. We're asking that God would change our viewpoint. We're looking at different views of things we've looked at before. How God wants to shape and use my life. How he wants to use my testimony. That God wants me to learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Well, today I'm going to talk to you about something I've never said before. I'm going to share this. It's kind of a long title, but I hope it makes sense to you. This is the title today. I know know God loves me, but does he like me? I know God loves me, but does he like me? Everything we hear and read tells us that God loves us, right? We hear it. Pastor, you preach it all the time. I've heard it. I've read it in Scripture. God loves us. God loves us. Greater love hath no man than this. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves us, lavishes his love upon us. All these verses and verses that talk about that God loves us. I don't think we have a hard time believing in God loves us. I think the problem is this, do we think God likes us? Does he really want to be with me? Is he really like me? I I know he loves us, but does he really like us? It doesn't automatically sink in. I know that we would think we hear the word love and we think, well, if he loves us, he's got to like us, right? But it doesn't automatically translate because there's people in this room who struggle with this thought. I know God loves me, but he, he really, does he really like me? We doubt that he really, really says I'm his favorite. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're God's favorite. You're God's favorite today. I want you to know that God really loves you. And more than just loving you, he really likes you and wants to be with you. He wants you to know that our Heavenly Father really, really cares about you. He loves you very much. I feel like God loves us because he has to, right? You ever been there? Pastor, I know God loves us. He he has to because the word tells us that he loves me. And it says that he cannot lie. He can't go back on a promise. So if God says he loves me, he really has no choice, but he's got to love me. He can't be a liar. So we know that he loves us because we kind of feel like he's under a covenant, right? He's made a covenant with us. He he loves us. He's obligated to love us. And sometimes we got to understand that love is so much bigger than like, right? Love is so much bigger than like, but for many of us, we can, we can grasp that he loves us, but we don't grasp that he really likes us. It's, it's kind of like, you know, when you, you ever have your kids when they were younger and you're like, honey, I just need to get away for a few days or a few hours. I love you. I love our kids, but I got to get out of the house. I got to get out and do something. I got to get away for a few days. Any moms or dads been there before? You love your family. You love your kids. But you're like, you know what? I just, I got to get out. I remember when raising a father of five, my wife and I, we raised five children. And after we did a family vacation of all five of us together, I said, honey, I I love you. I'm going to miss you. But we ain't going on vacation together again like that. You take the girls, I'll take the boys, and let's go, we just split up. Because when we get done with this vacation, I am so worn out. Don't get me wrong, I love my kids. You know I love my kids. But there was a time I didn't like being with every one of them at the same time. This last, vaca- last summer, we all went on vacation together for the first time in a long time. And my wife and I looked at each other and said, isn't it so nice that our kids actually get along now? We can actually, they're at that age where they actually can get along and they enjoy each other. It's like, we're, we're back together again. We're a happy family again. But I can tell you, it wasn't always that easy. There was times when I, I loved my kids and my family, but I, I had to have a little time away. And the reason why I say that is it's really easy to understand that we, we love, but sometimes we don't always think people like. 
And if we're not careful, we can fit God into this category like we think. Well, I know that my, my parents loved me. They had to because you know that, all right, they had kids and I've had kids and I know that you love your kids. But because the parent wasn't around, because the parent didn't take time to make you a priority, because the parent was absent or the parent didn't show up when they said they were going to show up, things happen. you like, I know my parents love me, but inside you struggle. Did they, did they really like me? I mean, there's a lot of people. We have a generation of people who deal with that same question. And if we're not careful, we'll take those earthly feelings we have for our earthly parents and we'll put that on God. God, I know you love me, but do you really like me? Do you really, really like me? Look at 1 Peter 2, 9. I think God really addresses it here. He says, but you, talking about us, you are a what? Let's say it together. Chosen people. Wow. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may be declared the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We must have a clear view of how God defines us. You got to understand this. You got to know what God says about you. You got to know that God really loves you. And more than that, you got to know he really wants to be with you. He really enjoys your presence. He really likes you that much. We got to understand it because the world will define who you are. The world will classify you with a name. The world will give you a name. And God says you are a chosen people. You are a chosen people. You know, we're chosen. And I think it goes back to grade school. Remember being picked on teams in grade school? You pick your team, I'll pick your team, my team. You go first. I pick Sally, I pick Joe, I pick Sue. And you're like, if you're picked first, it's a privilege, but also a responsibility, right? Like, well, I gotta, I gotta show up in this game. I gotta show up in this activity. I gotta do well. Let them know I'm worthy of my first round draft pick. If you pick last, you take it personal. If you pick next to last, you're like, Phew, at least I wasn't last. And then we go out and we try to perform and prove you shouldn't have picked me last. You should have picked me first. You shouldn't have, whoever the last person was, no, you have them, no, you can take them, no, you can take them. I don't want them, you take them. Ever been there, been that person? Yeah, we've all been there. It doesn't make you feel well, does it? And you, you go out and you try to perform and show that you belong. Show that you should have picked me first. Show the coach you should have started me over that person. Show the teacher you should have picked me for that position. We're always, always trying to perform. And we learn it at an early age. I love what Ephesians says here. Ephesians 1, 4 through 5 says, For he chose us. Wow. He chose us. We are a chosen people. He chose us in him before creation of the world to be holy and to be blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. I love this, that he says that he loved us so much that he planned on adopting us. What's that mean? That means he knew at creation that man was going to fall and he was going to send his son to redeem mankind that through the blood of Jesus, you and I could be predestined to be adopted back into the family, not stronger than the blood covenant right there with Jesus. We are now included as sons and daughters into the kingdom. He knew this. He loved us this much that he predestined that we are adopted. He chose us. I, I love this story because it reminds us of this point here. And I just love to tell the story anytime I have a chance. Some of you have heard it before. But when my daughter Melissa, we adopted her when she was four years old. She was our niece and we adopted her at four. And a few years later, when her little brothers began to fight with her and one day I came home and she's crying. I said, what's wrong, honey? She said, the boys told me I was adopted and I didn't belong in this family. Of course, as you know, it's bound to happen with kids and fighting. And I sit down with her and I wiped her tears away. I said, let me tell you something, honey. When your brothers were born at the hospital, 
They made me take them home. I didn't have a choice. I was, I was stuck with those stinking boys. But I chose for you to be my daughter. There was a lot of people who wanted to adopt you, and we fought for you, and we chose you, and we put a lot of effort into choosing you to be our daughter. And she smiled real big, and she got it went off. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right, Dad. Yeah, yeah. Those stinking boys, they didn't have a choice, but me, they had a choice. I believe that's the way today we got to have an idea that God says, I chose you. I didn't have to choose you. He could have started over again. He could have started from scratch, but he loved you enough. He loved me enough to say you are predestined to be a son and a daughter into the kingdom. By the blood of my son Jesus, you can now walk in chosen of the Lord. I choose you. I choose to love you. I choose to redeem you. I choose to forgive you. I choose to give you inheritance. I choose to bless you. I choose to be with you. He chose us. It's the spirit of adoption that he gave to us. God chose us ever before we had a chance to perform. I didn't have to perform to get his love. It says before I was ever born, he chose me. He knew me and chose me. Before I ever had a chance to say, God, forgive me. Before I ever had a chance to accept what Jesus did on the cross, he chose me. He loved me. What are you saying, pastor? This. Stop auditioning. Stop trying out for something. Stop auditioning for something you already have. You've already been chosen of God. You're not auditioning for God's love. You're not asking God to pick me. He's already picked you on his team, son. He's already picked you on his team, daughter. You're already walking in a sonship. You're already walking in daughtership today. Know that God is already pleased with you. God already loves you. He will never love you any more than he loves you right now. And he won't love you any less than he loves you right now. Stop auditioning. Quit trying to earn something God's already given you. You're a son. You're chosen. You're a daughter. You're chosen. Know that today about you. He chose you. He chose me. Then he called us a royal priesthood. Turn to your neighbor and say, okay, Father. A royal priesthood? What are you saying? I'm not the Pope. What are you trying to say, Pastor. Well, you got to understand the language of this time period. Now, when it was said, not only were you a chosen people, you are a royal priesthood. For thousands of years, when this was given, the only way you could get to God was through the priest. The only person who was allowed to go in God's presence was the priest. You and I would have to bring our sacrifices to the high priest. The high priest would then take them behind the veil into what they call the holies of holies. And only the high priest was allowed to go in there and offer up in the presence of God to be with God. Only the high priest was allowed to be in the presence of God. But something miraculous happened. The Bible says when Jesus gave his life on the cross and he drew his last breath here on earth and he cried out, Father, it is finished. It says that when he took his last breath that the earth began to rumble. There was a mighty earthquake and the veil of the temple was ripped in half. So that is a really big deal for you and I. The fact that God calls you and I a royal priesthood means this, that the veil has been ripped. No longer is the presence of God just for the priest behind the veil. But now the veil has been ripped and he calls you and I a royal priesthood. He calls you and I, said, come on, spend time with me. I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to love you. I want to spend with you all this time. I want to lavish my love upon you. I want to hear what's burdening you. I want to share my plans for your life. He longs to be with us, royal priesthood. Now you can boldly approach the throne. Now you can be in the presence of God. Now you are made clean, not because of the sacrifice you make, but because of the sacrifice that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, gave for you and I. Now you and I are royal priesthood. We're a chosen people. We are a royal priesthood. You got to understand who you are. Quit letting the world define you. Uh, you're, a, you're a failure. 
you're a mistake. You're this, you're that. Quit letting everybody else define you. Know who you are in God. God defines you and God lets you know who you are. You are a royal priesthood. The veil was ripped so that we could spend time with him. He wants us to spend time with him. We have to understand how much that God put in to that effort. I mean, think of the plan. He didn't wipe us out and start over again and say, I'll just start over. I'll have a new Adam and new Eve. I'll just start over again. I mean, he went through a lot of effort to redeem us. He went through a lot of effort to save us. His son made a big sacrifice. The father made a big sacrifice to give his life so that we could walk into redemption, that he could choose us to be royal priesthoods. He says, you are a royal priesthood. You says, you are a holy nation. This is a big deal. You and I are a holy nation. Remember, Israel was considered the holy nation. Jesus' own people. But when his own people rejected him, he said, "This this is just not for them. But this is, you're my people. All those who now receive the word, even the holy nation of Israel, those who rejected me, if you, the Gentiles, will begin to accept me, you are now called a holy nation. It's an amazing thing. That's why he calls us a holy nation. It's, it's a privilege. Before it was just for Israel. Now he looks at us and says, we're a holy nation. Romans 3.29 backs it up. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also, also the God of the Gentiles? That's us. Of course, he is. He's our God. And he says, you're a royal priesthood. You're chosen of me. You're a holy nation. Stop letting everybody else's opinion define who you think you are. Let me tell you, you're losing sleep on people's opinion about you that don't matter. Well, they talked about me and they said this about me. I get it. Whoever said sticks and stones <laughs> will break your bones, but words don't hurt. They lied. Words hurt. And they stick with you. But see, when you understand the mighty word, when you understand God's word trumps those words, we're going to say, God says, they may call you this, but I call you forgiven. I call you redeemed. I call you a chosen people. I call you a holy nation. I call you a royal priesthood. No, you can walk with your head held high, knowing you're redeemed, knowing God has chosen you, and God has got a plan for your life of redemption. God has plans for your life, and it's bigger than what everybody else's plans are. Stop letting their opinion of you keep you trapped. See, the more you understand God's opinion of you, it busts open the doors in your life. It takes away the barriers. And you say, all right, God, anything is possible. Understand who you are in God. It's important. You've got to define that because God has defined it for you. Let God's words define you. As a mother and father, one of the greatest privileges we have is naming our children, isn't it? I mean, what a privilege to name. It's a big responsibility. Some people don't say it. They keep it tight until the baby is born. I don't want anybody else stealing my baby name. I ain't giving it. I ain't telling nobody. Any mom say, uh, you know, I've seen some of you. I know. It, it's a big deal. Baby names become a big deal to some people. Really, really take it serious. It's a privilege. I mean, yeah, I remember putting those names She's like, we're going, we got twins. They got a match, Gene. I said, okay, what do you want to call them? I said, if they're girls, we can call them Monique and Unique. She didn't like that idea. <laughs> well, we got Landon and we got Preston. How about Hayden and Hallie? Like, okay, that sounds great. A lot of thought went into it. I mean, a lot of thought went into it. We had meals after meals and baby book names after baby book names. I was hearing baby names in my sleep. I'm like, just, just pick a name, honey, please. And she picked a name. Went, no, I don't like that one. <laughs> Finally, we, we agreed. It was a big deal. You know, it's a big deal what people name your children. I heard a story the other day about a lady who was 
six months pregnant and she was having complications and she slipped into a coma. And while she was in a coma, she was in a coma for six months. Of course, while she was in a coma, she gave birth to twins. She had a boy and a girl twin, just like we do. Had a boy and girl twin. And when she woke up, the doctor was there and said, I just want you to know you've been in a coma for six months. You've given birth to twins, a boy and a girl. They're fine and they're healthy. Uh, but that's what you know, you've been in the coma. She, he goes, but we didn't know when you was gonna wake up and we had to give an official name to your babies. And so we let your brother name your children. She goes, my brother? You let my brother, he's an idiot. You let him name my kids? She goes, well, just tell me, what, what did he name them? He goes, well, your daughter, he, he named Denise. She goes, well, Denise isn't bad. Denise is kind of pretty. All right. What did he name my son? D nephew. <laughs> How many know naming your kids is a big difference? It's a big deal. Names are a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal. When I see that child running down the court or on the field and they got my name on the back of that jersey. I take a little pride. I'm like, yeah, I, I named them. Yeah, they got our name on the back of that jersey. It's just something about that. You have pride in the name. Take pride in your name. Take security in your name. Let understand God has named you a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are chosen of him. Let me give you a handful of other names that God puts on the back of our jersey. Write these down. This is a good, good study for you to remind yourself who you are. I am. I am a child of God. I am his child. 1 John 3, 1 says this. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. You think he was trying to let us know something. God calls us his children, and for those who don't believe it, that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world, they don't recognize it, that we are God's children because they don't know him. He's saying the world, they don't see you as a royal priesthood. Who cares? God sees you as a royal priesthood. The world may not choose you. Who cares? I've chosen you. You got to understand who you are. I am his child. He loves me, and he really wants to be with me. I am valued. you got to understand, I am valued. Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air. This is what Jesus said. Do they not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them? And Jesus says, are you not much more valuable than they? Jesus says, we are much more valuable you got to understand, you are valued. How valuable are you? Jesus paid his life for you. That's how much he paid for you. You are valued. Put a price tag on that. That's how much you're valued. You are loved today. I don't feel loved, but you have never been loved any more than you have right now. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates. He's not a deadbeat dad. He showed up and put his money where his mouth was. He demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wow. He loved us when we were unlovable. He loved us when we didn't want to have anything to do with him. He loved us when we were a mess. He loved us anyway. I am loved, and I am accepted. I'm accepted. This is such a big deal. Understand, Romans 8, 1 says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. Those who belong to Christ Jesus today, you got to know he is not condemning you. He is loving you. He is choosing you. He ripped the veil so that you and I could spend time in his presence. He wants to know who you are, and he wants you to know who he is. Every day, he wants to unveil something new about him. Every day, he wants you to discover how much he loves you and values you. This is who you are. 
And the Bible goes on and gives us more names and more names and more names and more names. Know who you are. Understand that God loves me. God really not only loves me, but he actually likes me. He really likes me. And he wants to be with me. That's why he ripped the veil. That's why he sent his son. That's why Jesus went through everything he did. He really wants to be with us. Zephaniah 3.17, the last scripture I'm going to read, he says he will take what? Let's say it together. He will take great delight. Mm, what an awesome word. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I mean, Jesus God the Father, God the Son is so excited, so much in love with you. He likes you so much that he's actually rejoices over us with singing. I remember when we brought our, our babies home from the hospital, and I would be rocking them, and I'd be patting them, putting them to sleep. I'm not a singer. I'm not a, not a songwriter. But I'd be making up songs, singing my kids' songs as they went to bed and sleep. I was always making up a song, always singing. Why? Because I was so much in love. I loved him so much. I was rejoicing over the gift God had given me. And it says the Father has this same kind of love for you and I. He rejoices over us. He dances around us. He's excited for us. He takes pride in us problem is this. We know it, but it's got to move from our head to our heart. Don't let today's message stay right here. Don't let it come right here and say, yeah, you're right, pastor. I know that. I've read that. I've heard that. You're right. You're right. No, take it a step further. Move it from your head to your heart and say, I really understand I'm really understanding that God really loves me that much. And he really not only loves me, he likes me and wants to be with me. He calls me his own. He chose me as his own. He calls me royalty. He calls me son. He calls me daughter. You got to see it and believe it. I read it. It's up here. But then I believe it in my heart. I believe it's true. You are God's special possession. That's what he says. We are God's special possession, called to proclaim his great likeness. We're his great possession. Somebody asked me one time and said, what, what, do, you, what do you hold as a great possession? And I thought about it. It's like, I, I don't know, you know. He goes, if you want to know what you hold as a great possession, let's say you went home and you, your house is on fire. What, you could only go in and get one thing. What would that one thing be? And I think about it and I was like, you know, the only thing I would go in and try to save besides my dog would be my kids, my family. That's it, my wife and kids. That's the only thing I would go in and try to save because they're my most prized possessions. Jesus did this for us. He went and he rescued us from the fire. He went and he rescued us and pulled us out of the grip of sin. He went and he rescued us because we are his prized possessions. He loved us enough to go through the pain of the cross. He, he left the heavenly throne to walk on earth to be misunderstood, to be false accused, to put himself through all that. Why? Because he loved us that much. You are God's prized possession. A holy nation, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, his special possession. Let's bow our heads. Today, if you hear, say, Pastor, I... I'm so lost without Jesus. My life has been a life where I've been looking to make Jesus my Lord and Savior, and I just haven't done it. But today, I am ready to make sure that I'm in right standing with God. 
the Bible says we, there's nothing we can do other than put our faith in the finished work of the cross. We have to believe that he was the Messiah, God's only son. We have to believe that he died on the cross for the sins of the world. And through that finished work of the cross, now my sins can be forgiven. It can't be earned. I can't do anything to be good enough. It's only because of what Jesus did on the cross. And if you're here today and say, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm ready to make sure to surrender my life to Jesus. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to single you out. We're not going to embarrass you. Without anybody looking at me and you're ready to make that decision today, can you just raise your hand and say, Pastor, I'm ready to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior today. Just raise a hand. Hi, where I can see it. Let me see it. Thank you. I see the hand. Yeah, I see those. Thank you. Anybody else want to join them today? Raise it right now. Let me see. Thank you. I want you to say this prayer after me if you raised your hand. As Christians around you, we'll help you along as well. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Messiah, God's only son. From this day forward, I will live for you and I will follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you pray that prayer for the first time, you say welcome to the family of God. Give him a big hand clap. Stand up on your feet this morning.